Christmas. Uh, we don't have children's church today. So, huh? No, not this morning. It's okay if they burn because we don't have to burn them next week. So, <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to be very careful. But <laughs> because we don't have children's church, I thought I might have to bribe some kids to, to stay in here for the sermon. Uh, it's not going to be a long sermon, but still, uh, we don't have a lot of kids in here this morning. So, uh, uh, But I was prepared because I got not just for kids, but some for Tim, too. So that he can sit still during the sermon and, and put up with, with this uh, short sermon without fidgeting too much, right? <laughs> Tim comes into my office, I'm going to tell on him, comes into my office and, and starts, because I got some candy left over, he starts looking for the open bag. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> I'm like, eat all you want because I don't need it sitting there, especially if it's open. And then I'll partake. Well, we're going to continue our study. It just happens to fall right in line. Uh, but we're going to continue our study of the story of God and man. And today we're going to deal with the incarnation. And our text, theme text, is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and thank you and rejoice that indeed Christ was born into the world. We thank you and we, as we celebrate this morning, Father, that so many were able to make it today, Lord. And Father, we lift up those who are not, those who are sick, uh, Lila and Lisa home with COVID, uh, Danea and the boys at home with a cold, uh, not COVID, and so, uh, and any others, Lord, that, that are still suffering and sick, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with them, Father. Just pray that you would uh, be with us as we gather together before you, and I pray, Father, that our hearts would be stirred today, and I thank you for the, the singing this morning, Lord, and the the opportunity to express our joy in our salvation that was brought to us that Christmas morn. And Lord, we just thank you that you've given us the, the word that communicates the truth, the reality of that birth, or the significance of the birth of one man out of the billions that have lived on this planet. The significance of the birth of one child, one baby born in a manger. An insignificant place, an insignificant way of coming into this world, but the most significant that's ever happened, Father. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have been looking at the prophecies concerning the seed of the woman, the Messiah, or anointed of God, who is to be the prophet, the priest, and the king and who will establish Israel in her blessing and bring righteousness and justice to the world. Now this expected Messiah that Israel uh, was, was looking toward it was the hope of the remnant of Israel. I mean, this is what they focused on, the, the coming Messiah, those who truly believed and worshipped the Lord and, and those who were at least influenced by the Word of God, even though they may themselves have, have set themselves up in, uh, in, in their own righteousness and were expecting a little bit of a different Messiah but nevertheless it was their, their focal point but there was even more to these prophecies than was generally expected by even the faithful remnant including the reality that Messiah would be God in the flesh today as we celebrate Christmas we see that Jesus Christ born of the Virgin Mary was truly God incarnate now, what does that mean? Well, the Lexham Bible Dictionary defines the Incarnation as the doctrine expressed in the Nicene Creed and the definition of Chalcedon that Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten before all the ages and of one substance with the Father, was made flesh through the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, making Him truly God and truly man, possessing two natures which are not confused, changed, divided, or separated. Well, that's a... 
a mouthful there, and it's, it, but it has some tremendous significance. It defines our understanding of the doctrine of Christ. And remember what John, First John says, or Second John says: if you don't have the doctrine of Christ, you do not have God. Now, it's true that in various polytheistic religions and myths of the ancient world, there were numerous instances of humans being said to have, uh, you know, divine origins. You know, sometimes you hear about the gods coming down and, and cohabitate, cohabiting with, with women or, or even vice versa and begetting uh, uh, a half man, half god called demigods. Well, the Lexham Bible Dictionary references this. It says, many heroes and rulers in the ancient Greece and the Near East were considered to be descendants of a god. Homer and Hesiod portrayed Zeus as the father of men as well as other gods. Greek heroes were often said to be descendants of Zeus and a mortal woman. Plato and Pythagoras, among the other famous philosophers, were thought to be sons of a god. The titles son of God, son of Helios, or son of Zeus often were given to Egyptian rulers from the 4th century B.C. onward. So it's kind of a common concept, except that the concept that we just discussed is rooted in a polytheistic worldview not in the monotheism of Judaism. See, this isn't, when we talk about the incarnation, we're not talking about a God who is little more than a glorified human producing a hybrid being from a human mate. In, in, in this polytheistic world, the, the, the gods are barely more exalted than man. And so well, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something radically different. And that is not that a God entered into the world, but the God entered the world. The God who is not bound by limitation. The infinite God whose being is infinite without limit. God who is spirit coming into the world and taking on a finite human nature. This is the God entering into the natural realm and becoming a man. But is this doctrine that we hold to, that's rooted in the Nicene Creed, or expressed in the Nicene Creed, is it rooted in Scripture? Well, I'm happy to say that, yes, it is. And it's why Christmas is truly, truly special. So let's take a look at it. The first thing that we need to note is, when we look at the Old Testament, that the Jews, especially the remnant, should have expected God in the flesh. Now, I'm just going to bring out one verse. Uh, we're going to see Messiah is God. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, that's speaking of the physical, uh, natural uh, nature of the, of the child. Unto us a son is given. Now, in context, and, uh, and ultimately we understand that a son is given means this is not referring to the, the humanity of Christ, but to his deity, the, that he is the son of God. So to us a child is born, un, uh, for, a, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his gover government and peace there will be no end, Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In other words, this is, a, this is going to be a supernatural act by God, something that he accomplishes, that he is going to send the ruler to take the throne. We know this is the Messiah, we know this is the, the seed of the woman, and he is both mighty God and everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. All these titles indicate that he will be both God and man. And guess what? The scriptures are clear. Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus who? Jesus Messiah. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Right there. 
the, 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 the human nature that, that she uh, has in her that is going to be born, this human being is a child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was mine to put, it, put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, you know, isn't that awesome that he actually deliberated and just instead of acting immediately? He didn't just respond in, a, in an offended and unloving way. He actually thought about it. He actually took the time to, to, to consider what he would do. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, there's the, the uh, legal line of descent, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her until they had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. It's clear Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit. This is a, a supernatural event and that he is the descendant, in, at least through the legal line of Joseph, a descendant of David. And I think we see that in Luke probably it's, it's Mary's descent. Uh, that's a little bit complicated. But nevertheless, the, a virgin conceives and bears a son. She is with a child and she bears a son and they call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. In other words, it's more of a title than a, than a personal name. We see this personal name is Jesus, which means God saves. So we see that Jesus is the Messiah. So they should have been expecting that. But of course, some of the, the, the Bible is a little difficult to read sometimes, isn't it? It's a little hard until you, until you really understand. I think there were probably some who did expect that and did understand that. Maybe not the full significance of it. Uh, but the vast majority were just expecting a Messiah. They didn't expect that the Messiah would be God incarnate, but he is. And since Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is God incarnate. And we see that so clearly in our original text this morning. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the what? The Word. And the Word was with God. It means alongside of, right? Beside, there's distinction there. Uh-oh, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. The Word was with God. That's, there's a distinction between the Word and God until you read the rest of it. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him without, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And so... The Word was with God, the Word was God, and then when you look down at John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word, what? Became flesh, and tabernacled among us, or dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And later on you see in John that Jesus shared the glory of God. He is... God in the flesh, but here we're talking about the Word. So how do we know that the Word really is Jesus? Because John didn't identify Him as Jesus. But notice what John 1.3 says, All things were made through Him. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5-6 through 6 says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So do you see the connection? The Word in the beginning was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. 
and without him nothing was made. And through, uh, uh, you know, there's one Lord Jesus through whom are all things and through whom we live. So we see this connection then between the Word and Jesus. We also see a direct connection between the Word and Jesus in the first epistle of John. 1 John 1, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That, so the eternal life was with the Father and is manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you, may also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus the Messiah. We also see this in connection with the term light. John chapter 1, verse 9 through 10 says, That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. So the word is also the light, and the world is made through the light, he who is the light, but yet the world did not know him. But look at John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Do you understand what God is saying through us through this? That Jesus is the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Just the, the profoundness. You can't state it any clearer than John 1.1. 1, 1. And yet there are people out there who foolishly deny that Jesus is God. That foolishly deny it. You couldn't be any clearer. The, the Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the amazing thing about Christmas. It's not the presents. You know? It, it's, it's not the, the trees and the, and the candles and all the, the stuff we love that's, that's awesome. And I love Christmas. Don't get me wrong. I, I wouldn't do away with any of the... Of the the decorations or any of that stuff. I might tone down some of the secularism and some of the commercialism, but, but the, the celebration part of it, we go look at Christmas lights probably once or twice a week. Uh, you know, we, we drive all the way up to Houston to go look at them up in, in River Oaks, and we go to the ones where they have the, the music tied to it, and, 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 you know, I like to go, go look at the houses. They like to look at the ones with the music, and so we, we trade off. We go to Green Tea Terrace. We love all that stuff. I, I love decorating for Christmas. I love having a Christmas tree. But that's all because I love the fact that God became man. And it's a joyous, joyous event that I want to celebrate, that I want to beautify and, and bring glory and honor. Think about it. How much glory. That's, those lights reflect the glory of God in a sense, in a minor way. But nevertheless, the idea is there. And I read somewhere that during the holiday season, during like December, 6% of the energy that is used by Americans is the Christmas lights. <laughs> now you think about that. That's a lot of electricity for Christmas lights. Just to glorify, to glorify God. Maybe not in everybody's minds but in mine, because I know the true significance that Jesus Christ was born in the world, that he was indeed God incarnate. So the Word, who is with Jesus, was in the beginning with God and was God. Couldn't be made clearer. There's no better way of saying it. Thus, Scripture reveals that what we call the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, one God in three persons, or one three uh, our, our three who's and one what is a biblical doctrine because we see elsewhere that the Holy Spirit is also God, united with God and the Son. So this union between Father and Son is 
is perfectly clear, but it gets even clearer. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. Many, uh, then the Jews took up again uh, stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered and said to them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, they got that part right, make yourself God. They understood what he is saying when he says, I and my Father are one. They know that he's claiming to be God. Because he was. Or how about John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus is like, <laughs> have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? Do you not understand who I am, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Are you not getting it yet, Philip? Why do you not understand? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Well, some people don't. Some people do not believe that the Father and the Son are one. They do not believe that Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Him. He says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. But if you're still not clear, if you're still, you know, letting obscure or, or interesting uh, uh, verses trip you up because you don't understand that when you ask a question about Jesus, you're actually asking, asking two questions. You say, well, could Jesus uh, uh, die? Well, yes, as a man, but no, not as God. So you got two questions there. You're talking about his deity or his humanity. His humanity could die, but his deity could not. And sometimes we get, us, get ourselves a little confused about just who Jesus is because we don't understand the, the proper way to form the questions or to, the proper way to, to apply the passages. So what I'm giving you today are the clear, <laughs> the abundantly clear passages to help you interpret all the other passages. And here it is. Colossians 2, 8 through 9. Couldn't be any more clear. Be lest, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily period end of discussion Jesus is the Messiah Messiah is God incarnate Jesus is God incarnate well, how do we apply this on a Christmas morning? It's not a whole lot of application there, you know. I can't go out and be uh, a God incarnate. <laughs> I could be human, certainly, and I, I certainly am. But, well, I think that we need to apply it by affirming the doctrine. Second John 9 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. We need to make sure that we understand the significance of Christmas, of why we celebrate, of why it's is a joyous season, uh, of why there's a, a proclamation of goodwill. It's because God has entered into the world in the most interesting of ways as a babe born in a manger and we believe that we believe and agree with all true Christians about the doctrine of Christ in fact uh, we as a, a church are in full agreement 
with the Nicene Creed as it addresses these issues. For it says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. It means they have the same essence. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. And to bring the rest of it in, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah, God in the flesh, come to tabernacle among us. What a picture that tent in the wilderness was where the glory of God resided with Israel and didn't follow them around but led them where they would go. Amen? Well, the second way that we can apply this, not just affirming the doctrine but living it out, is to celebrate the, the birth of the incarnate God. In other words, Merry Christmas! Remember, it's about Jesus. Go home, have some great food, enjoy the day, give God the thanks for the food and the family and the friends and the presents and the tree and all the, the trappings, but mostly that he came into the world to save us from our sins. May God's blessing be upon you. And we'll see you after the new year. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and give you thanks that you have given us this Christmas day, Lord, to, to rejoice and celebrate for the birth of your son. Thank you so much. Lord, we know that for him it was the beginning of his long road that ended at Calvary. And Father, we know that just as Mary rejoiced in, her, in the birth of her son and, and raised him with, with love and cherished him and, and, and had <laughs> probably more hope for him than any other human being because she knew who he was and on some level, she probably didn't see Calvary coming. And Lord, help us to be mindful that Jesus wasn't born just to live. He was born to die in our place so that you could rescue us from this broken, evil, wicked world and deliver us from the, the wicked generation of our time. Christmas is salvation. It is deliverance. But it's not complete until Easter. Father, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.